Good morning, everybody. If you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook, it means that you're watching the pre-recorded feed because our website or our live streaming was not working the way we had hoped. You are the church. The church is not 139 Smith Street where the meeting place gather, gathers. The church is wherever the people of Jesus from the meeting place are serving and worshiping together. So if you're gathered in somebody's living room and, and you're with those in your life group, you are the church. If you're meeting with others whom you regularly serve with and you're having brunch and participating in a live stream or video stream of the service, the teaching and the music, I want you to know that you are the church. And together around Winnipeg, we are are the church, along with many other congregations that are figuring out the same challenges, having some of the many of the same problems, but also experiencing the same joy of worshiping our Savior. Why don't we pray together, and then I'll give you a roadmap for where we're going to go. Heavenly Father, around our world there is great fear, and you said that perfect love casts out fear. We gather in your love. We worship in the knowledge that you love us deeply. And we think of those for whom the options that we are enjoying right now, in terms of the comforts of a home, the privileges of technology, the ability to um, enjoy each other's company, those privileges, those opportunities are simply out of reach for many. Jesus, I pray that you would be with them even as you are with us right now. And as we learn and worship together, I pray that your spirit would indwell us and work through us. Amen. This morning, we are continuing in our series where we are looking at various people's encounters with Jesus in the Gospels. Today, we're looking at four stories out of Mark's Gospel, four stories that interact with each other and grow our understanding as we understand one feature in a story, we discover new insight in another. As a question is asked in one story, an answer is given in another. Today I want us to talk about fear, faith, and following Jesus. So it's a week where we are for the first time canceling a service gathering because of the COVID-19 virus, the coronavirus. And many people are afraid of many things. Saturday morning, I went to Superstore, as is my normal pattern. I purchased a few of the basic household goods. But usually when I go to Superstore at 7 in the morning on Saturday, it's a ghost town. There is nobody there. This morning, I pulled into the parking lot at 7.03, and the parking lot was jam-packed like it was the last shopping opportunity before Christmas. I got into the store and shelves were bare as carts were piled high with toilet paper. Um, there was one person who had four gallons of palm olive dish detergent. I don't know how long they figured this crisis would go, but who uses four gallons of palm olive, di palm olive dish detergent even in a year? People clearly have fear in their hearts. Let me ask you the question, what are you afraid of? I want us to think very carefully about the things that we're afraid of because Jesus' words are really that perfect love casts out fear. And he says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, with prayer and supplication, give your request to God. Jesus says, cast your cares upon me. What are you afraid of? You know, the disciples in the stories we're going to look at were afraid. There was a community that surrounded a man who was demon-possessed, and they were afraid. There was a synagogue ruler whose daughter was dying, and he was afraid. And there was a woman who had had a, a problem where she had been bleeding for about 15 years, most likely a menstrual problem, and she was afraid. Let me ask you the question. In these days, with whatever's in your newsfeed, with whatever changes are happening in your home, in your workplace, and in your school, what are you afraid of? And let me ask you the next question, why are you afraid? 
You see, it's one thing to be afraid of something, but it's another thing to check the motives of our hearts. The question, why are you afraid, goes to some of our deepest feelings, our, our convictions, our beliefs. And why are we fearful? Jesus poses this question to his disciples. So grab your Bibles, and one of the things that we're going to have to do together is look at our Bibles. As much as we're trying to do technology well, we haven't gotten to the place yet where all of the scriptures and all of the video can be seen at the same time. So I'm going to depend on you turning to Mark chapter 4 and reading with me. Mark chapter 4, Jesus has been teaching, and it says, that day when evening came, in verse 35, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go to the other side. Now, Jesus is teaching in Capernaum, his hometown. And the other side of the lake, if you were to cross from the widest point to the widest point, is eight miles or 13 kilometers. The place that they went to is probably more like five miles away. Jesus says, let us go to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him, and a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. His disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up and rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. And then the wind died down and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? It says they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. You know, these four connected stories pose four different insights. In this first story, Jesus demonstrates his power over the natural world. Even the wind and the waves obey him. We desperately, in these times, wish Jesus would step in and intervene and demonstrate his power over the natural world, don't we? We wish this whole virus thing, this pandemic, would simply be solved and go away. Jesus stopped the wind and the waves, and the response was terror on the parts of the disciples. You know, as we consider the ways Jesus demonstrates his power, we have to ask the question, do we want Jesus to demonstrate his power in our lives? What faith would that call out of us? How would we respond? Because our invitation to Jesus' action is a request to respond. It's like Jesus is saying, I'm going to do this. Now what will you say and what will you do? What do you now believe? Let's take a look at the next story because the first story and the second story are connected. Now we're at the beginning of chapter 5 in Mark's Gospel. They went across to the lake, the lake, to the region of the Gerizines. I was on those shores almost exactly a year ago in Israel, standing at the Sea of Galilee. And there's a steep, steep slope coming down from hills towards the lake. And the slope is covered with fields. And among the fields are cliffs. And in those cliffs are caves. There's many caves along this side. And it is gorgeous. It's beautiful there. Jesus got out of the boat, and a man with an impure spirit came from him from the tombs to meet him. Came out of those caves where they would have used them as tombs to meet Jesus. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained, hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills... He would cry out and cut himself with stones. This is a man to be feared, isn't he? If you were to ask his community, what are you afraid of? They would say, that man, that demon-possessed man. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want me to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torment me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. 
Here is a man who is demon possessed and he recognizes in Jesus that he was the son of the most high God. Do you remember the question the disciples asked in the story as they were crossing the boat? Who is this man? This demon possessed man had a pretty clear idea who, of who Jesus was. The demonic in him recognized another spiritual force that was greater than they and that was beautiful and pure. Jesus, the Son of the Most High God. The story continues. Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again to not send them out of the area. This is the demon, the demonic speaking to Jesus, not the humanity of this man. A legion of soldiers would have been, oh, 3,000 to 6,000 soldiers. We are a legion. This man was tormented by many things. Let me ask you the question. What are you tormented by? What are you tormented by? This is a real thing for us because we have things in our lives that we are tormented by. It says that a large herd of pigs was feeding on a nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us out among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Here's one of the ways that these stories interact. Water is a place of fear and dread. Most people didn't swim. And so to be in the water was to most likely lose your life. Water is also the source of things that were understood to be evil, things that were not well understood. And so the disciples crossing the sea in the storm were experiencing the chaos and they were terrified. And here the pigs go into, the demons go into the pigs and rush down into the water, the place where chaos comes from. See, we have to ask the question, where do we believe chaos comes from? Today I want to tell you that chaos does not come from God. If you are wondering about where and why and how the circumstances of a COVID-19 virus epidemic that is spanning the world happens, I want to tell you today that this is not from God because our God is not a God of chaos. It's a really important thing for us to think about because we often go, Jesus, why? God, why is this happening? And I want you to know that chaos is not God's plan for this world and it's not God's plan for your and my life. It says, those who were tending the pigs, this is verse 14, those who were tending the pigs ran off and reported this in town and country and the people went out to see what had happened. They came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. You know, it's one thing to experience fear related to chaos, but it's another thing to experience the end of chaos and understand that a greater power than chaos has come among us. Jesus is a greater power than chaos that comes among us and calms our fears, but it makes us ask a whole bunch of questions about our lives. It says those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. Think about the chaos, the, think about the, the devastation that this healing will have brought. This is clearly a Gentile area, not a Jewish area, because the herds were pigs, unclean animals to the Jews. And these people would have recognized that a legion of demons, having gone into the pigs and now having destroyed the pigs, it meant their economy was ruined. Just as we're experiencing stock market crashes this past week, just as people are feeling fragile about their own employment circumstances, the people in this story experienced their economy being ruined. And they were terrified. They said, Jesus, what you've done for this man, fantastic. But what it means for us is devastating. And they asked Jesus to leave. 
I think there's times in our lives where we ask Jesus to leave. We said the, the consequences of healing, the changes involved are more than we can accept. They're more than we can take. I don't know about you, but I long for Jesus to change my life. But am I really ready for what a new life looks like once Jesus changes it? It's a powerful thing to think about what I might lose and what might be gained when Jesus brings true transformation into my circumstances. So, Jesus was getting into the boat. They'd asked him to leave. He's going to leave. Jesus is getting into the boat. And the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. And Jesus did not let him, but said, Go to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis. That's a region of ten cities that were Gentile cities. The man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. What is the greatest healing that's happening in this man's life? Is it the fact that he's been freed from the demonic? Or is it the fact that Jesus has now asked him to return to his home where he will experience the rekindling and renewal of relationships, where family gets reconnected in ways that have long since been lost, where relationships that were broken become healed and restored. The, the power of Jesus' words here is, is to return a man to his community so that he again becomes fully human, because we are fully human as we are in relationship. Right now with the challenge of Social distancing, as public health officials are calling it, is, is, is an invitation for us to step away from relationship. Because social distancing often isn't just an extra few feet between us. It's often an increased emotional space, an increased relational distance. We already have endemic loneliness in our culture. And, and Jesus' invitation to this man is, is to deal with the endemic loneliness of his life. And he restores him to a community. Let's take a look at the next story, which follows right on its heels. When they had crossed over, the boat, over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd was gathered around him while he was by the lake. So he's right on the seashore. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, he pleaded earnestly, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. Jesus' response to our humanity and our struggles is to go with us. That's exactly what this story is telling. And then on the way, it says, a large crowd followed him and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was once now freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized the power had gone out of him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see, people were crowding against him. And his disciples answered, and yet you ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Here's an amazing story. A woman who has every reason to be afraid of being in public. She is ritually unclean. As someone who, it says, has an issue of blood, most likely an ongoing and unsolvable menstrual problem, is considered unclean. She would not have been able to eat with her family. She would have not been able to go to the marketplace to buy goods for her family. She would have not been able to have sexual intercourse. The result is she's most likely lost her family. 
She couldn't have participated in the worship life of the community at the synagogue or going up to Jerusalem to the temple. She was spiritually, socially, and community, communally isolated. And Jesus restores her by declaring in front of everyone, your faith has healed you. Just like the demon-possessed man was sent back to his community, Jesus restores this woman to her community by declaring her healing. You see, everybody would have said, oh, it's her, and steered clear. But now, with her healing declared, they had to reconsider what it meant to be in relationship with her. They had the opportunity to rekindle friendship and to rebuild family bonds. You see, when Jesus heals us, when our faith blooms and blossoms, Jesus wants to restore us to relationship. Immediately on the heels of this, the synagogue leader is standing there. It says, while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead. They said, why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing this, Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. When we think about our responses, Jesus invites our response to fear to be one of belief. The response to fear is a greater faith. Jesus did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. And he went in and said to them, why all the commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. Have you ever looked at reality and laughed because somebody doesn't get it? Here people are laughing at Jesus because they believe he doesn't understand reality. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, and he went in where the child was, and he took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kuma, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk. It says in brackets, she was 12 years old. Do you see that? When you look in your Bible, do you see in brackets, she was 12 years old? At this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders to not let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Here is a woman who is a, struggled with 12 years of menstrual bleeding and she is healed. And here is a 12-year-old girl who is raised to life and restored to her family. These things are all connected. Let's go back over these four stories. The terror of the water and the Jesus calming the sea demonstrates that he has power over the natural world, the wind and the waves. And then we see Jesus healing a man who is demonized, demonstrating that he has power over the spiritual world. And what does he do? He sends the demonic back to the water from where the chaos comes. And then we look at the relationship between the demonic, de demonized man and by the woman who had 12 years of menstrual bleeding, and in both cases, he restored these people back to their communities. And he did it in a way that was dramatically public, so people had to consider what their relationships would be like with them now. And then we take a look at the relationship between the healing of a woman's body and the raising to life of a little girl from the death. And these pieces are connected. Each of these stories links to the other demonstrating that there's many things in life that we can be afraid of, many things that cause us true fear and distress. And yet Jesus invites us to have faith, to believe. Today I want to invite you to consider what kind of faith Jesus is asking you to respond with. Jesus wants to invite you to move from fear to faith. Jesus wants you to consider what salvation means from the things that demonize you, whether they are spiritual forces or the torments of your soul. Jesus wants to bring wholeness to your body, but he also wants to restore you 
to relationship, to stop the problems that are part of social isolation. In story one, the disciples ask, who then is this man? And in story two, the demonized man says, this is the son of the Most High God. I want you to consider today what sort of things Jesus wants to do in your life. What fear Jesus wants to root out of your life. What faith he wants you to express in these days where there is so much chaos in our world. And what kind of kingdom is Jesus proclaiming? These stories ask us to consider that when we follow Jesus, our circumstances change in a way that are probably more than we could have initially hoped for and would even dare ask. I think it's a beautiful contrast in these stories between fear and faith. So if Jesus stormed into your life today, how would you respond? If you're gathered together with your life groups in a few minutes, I would ask you to answer that question for each other. If Jesus stormed into your life today, how would you respond? Let me ask you also, what things hold you in their grip? And what do you need to be freed from? I would encourage you to bring your fears to Jesus and say, I can't do anything about this anymore. I need you to do something in me. And let me ask you also, how would being sent home truly restore you? How would being sent back to your people be so restorative, not just for you, but for them also? Today, you will return to your routines, except nothing is like it was this time last week. In the coming days, schools will be closed, as the province has announced. In the coming days, people will pull away from when you when you naturally respond with a hug or reach out for a handshake, as we would normally do. And there will be a loss in your circumstances. I want to invite you to realize that when nothing is normal, Jesus particularly wants to show up in our lives so that we can experience his healing and his wholeness. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you sent Jesus in this world being fully God and fully human so he could experience everything that we have. Jesus, you understand the terror of our days, the confusion of our circumstances, the distresses in our lives, the loneliness in our relationships. You understand all of these things. And you come and you invite us to respond in faith to you because our faith response is the beginning of a change, a change where you want to change everything in our lives. Holy Spirit, comfort us, encourage us, and go with us. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this live stream or watching this on Facebook or on YouTube. I appreciate that we are gathered together as a church even as we're scattered around the city. I have a few things that I want to encourage you to do as we continue to be a church that wants to build each other up in love. First of all, if you're thinking about somebody today, text them. Text them a scripture. Pray, a script, pray with them via the phone. Do something that builds a spiritual connection. If you find that something wakes you up in the middle of the night, somebody's mind comes to you, some circumstance comes to you, I invite you to give it to our Heavenly Father in prayer and leave it with Him. There's things that are out of your and my control. That doesn't mean we don't worry, but we can take our worries and we can give them to God. I would also encourage you to think of those around you, your friends and neighbors, the people living on either side of you and across from you on your street or in your apartment, Take the opportunity to go knock on their door. Introduce yourself if you don't know them. And uh, say, if there's anything you have need of, please let me know. This is a time when we as a city must be more attentive to each other's needs and more ready to respond. The church called The Meeting Place will respond to the needs of the city when you, in your neighborhood, respond to the needs around you. Do it in the name of Jesus. 
If you find that there's a need that you can't respond to, that you need partnership with us with, please call the church. And one of us as pastoral staff will try to make a connection so that that need can be addressed. And if you personally have a need, a health need, an emotional health need because of anxiety or, or worry or other mental health things, if you find that you are struggling to get some supply in an age of scarcity, please reach out so that we can be really available to each, support each other. Don't go this alone. This is a time for us to be community like we've never been community before. Also, if you're watching this and you're not in a life group and you want to be connected to a group that gets together regularly, please call Pastor Paul. His number's uh, available on the website and on Facebook, and he will help connect you to a life group where you can experience social and emotional and relational support in a scale that's appropriate for the times that we're living in. Finally, I want to invite you to give. Our normal patterns are passing the bags here on Sunday morning and people will give via text or electronically. And so you'll see on the screen shortly a QR code. If you hold your phone up to that QR code, your phone camera, turn your camera on, your phone camera will take you straight to a website, um, on, to our website where you can give. I would encourage you to do something like um, pre-authorized deposits or making a credit card deposit that way, or you can text uh, using the text number that's on the phone to make it a donation. This is a time when, in fact, the resources of this community will be more needed as we serve our city, and so your generosity is also deeply appreciated. Thanks for joining us. God bless you, and I look forward to seeing you sometime soon in person.